Hi, Stephen. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm pretty good. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright, and this is The Wright Show. You are Stephen Asma, uh, professor of philosophy and a fellow of the research group in mind, science, and culture at Columbia College, Chicago. Correct. One yes. Of, one of several Columbia colleges in America, I guess. That's right. There's That's one, right. I think there's one in Missouri. Uh, yeah. Our, our claim to fame is we have the biggest film school in the country. Really? Yeah, just so you know. You should publicize that better because I didn't yes. know. That's right. Yeah, we have like a cadre of um, sort of Oscar winning cinematographers, like Spielberg's cinematographer is an alum and this kind of thing. So really? that's what we're known for. Oh, well, you're, you, you should do some work on the public relations front. I'll see what I can do to help. I'll tell thank everyone you, I thank see. You. Um, so you have written a number of books. Uh, one of them is Why I Am a Buddhist. That's a fairly recent one. You wrote an earlier one that was more of an anthropological kind of look at Buddhism as practiced in uh, Asia. That was called The Gods Drink Whiskey. Right. Uh, you've written other books, Buddha for Beginners. Um, and I want to talk, uh, and other books as well, but, but those are the three probably that are most relevant to this conversation. I, I, I want to talk uh, before we're through with this, about why you're a Buddhist, but also about uh, how Buddhism is practiced in Asia, because uh, you believe, and I think you're probably right, that there are a lot of misconceptions in the United States uh, about what Buddhism actually is, is practiced in, in Asia. Um, and you've argued that these misconceptions kind of, in some ways, distort the debate uh, here in the United States about religion, good or bad, you know, as it's uh, uh, as it's involved, for example, the New Atheist, you wrote an interesting piece in the Chronicle of Higher Education a few years ago about this. Um, finally, you've also written a paper on affective neuroscience and its relevance to our conception of the self, which is, uh, of course, very central to Buddhist philosophy, the, the way we think of the self and whether the self exists and so on. If we have time, I'd like to get, get, get to that as well. But there's certainly um, plenty to talk about. Um, before we get to why you are a Buddhist, why don't you talk a little about um, some of the misconceptions about Buddhism and how, how you became aware of those in your own, uh, in your own travels? Yeah, um, I think uh, it, starting in the, uh, well, when I was in college, I took some courses and, and was exposed to Buddhism. And then some of my graduate work and then my doctoral work was in Buddhism. And at that point, this was in the 90s, um, Buddhism was not quite the hot property it is now, um, although it was of interest, but at that time, as you'll remember, there was a big New Age movement. And so when I wrote my first book about Buddhism, it was to try to um, basically um, get rid of the hocus pocus and the supernatural aspects that had been, sort of been adopted by the New Age movement. Um, so when, when, you, I wrote, when you say get rid of, you mean uh, you undermine the credibility of or... Right. Well, the, the, at first, what what had happened was the New Age movement basically grabbed all this stuff from Eastern thought um, and mish, sort of mishmash of Buddhist and Hindu ideas and, well, some maybe some Egyptian ideas and, and stuff from uh, China and basically just made a kind of feel-good um, faith that, you know, if you wanted the world to change hard enough uh, in your favor, you could just wish it so and it would happen. And mm. I wanted to... It's funny, sort of, it's funny. That's always worked for me. I'm surprised to hear that... It, you're more powerful than most then. Yeah. <laughs> because I, I, I wanted to sort of make sure that people knew that Buddhism was more serious stuff than this. So that was the first work that I did was to try to show what's the Four Noble Truths and why Buddhism is really more of an early psychological theory. And, um, and that kept me going for about a decade. Uh, I, I was sort of on the road sort of making this argument. Um, and, uh, and then I started to go to Asia. Um, which <laughs> and, you, and you realized you had been the opposite of correct. <laughs> right. It wasn't that I was wrong uh, so much as I had a very provincial view myself of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And this, this is my main criticism of, uh, I think, of a lot of contemporary discussion of Buddhism, which is better than it was during the New Age period, but is still not informed by uh, Buddhism, sort of cultural Buddhism on the ground. And so you see this even in fans of Buddhism, like you'll see in Sam Harris, 
um, or or uh, Stephen. Well, Stephen Batchelor knows better, but uh, it, lots of fans of Buddhism also have kind of a bookish version of Buddhism that they've learned from Western uh, popularizers, uh, some of which are excellent. Um, I was one of them <laughs> in the 90s, uh, but I've come to have this much more, um, this richer understanding of Buddhism. I lived in Cambodia for a year. I lived in China on and off, in Shanghai, Beijing. I've traveled in Thailand, Laos, Vietnam. So I have a different picture of Buddhism, I think, than, than I did, certainly when I first uh, fell in love with the philosophy. Now, I, now there are, are these cultural components, which a lot of people treat as... Um, uh, sort of contaminations of the great, cl clean, hygienic, uh, psychological theory. But I have come to actually appreciate some of this uh, contamination as having a lot of wisdom also. So that's sort of the truth. So after I lived in Cambodia, I wrote a book about Southeast Asian Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism, which uh, people don't know that much about. But I know, I know you had Bhikkhu Bodhi on, on your show, which I think is a phenomenal. This guy's great and has done a great service to Theravada. Mm -hmm. And so I know you know about it, but not a lot of people know about Theravada Buddhism. So that book Although is I was going to ask you about that. Uh, I, I noticed there was an interview you did in 2005, and somebody said, why is uh, Zen so much more popular in the United States than Theravada? I was going to ask you if you think that's changed a little since then, because I, my exposure to Buddhism has come through uh, a Vipassana tradition, yeah. uh, which is, you know, more or less, you could say, mindfulness meditation, although I don't think they're, they're synonymous. Um, uh, and, um, and that's associated with Theravada. And, 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 and there are now big meditation centers that grow out of that tradition in, in the United States. Yeah. Uh, I think that's very recent. That's my yeah. view. Is that that yeah. you uh, have come in a way? That's the that's the best stuff in a way. To my mind, is um, Theravadan. Well, in the sense that Americans are getting the the most uncut, pure version of Buddhism now than they've ever gotten in the past. My own view is that you had a very strong interest in Japanese Buddhism after World War II for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. Then in the eighties and nineties, uh, there was a very strong interest in Tibetan Buddhism, which continues. Um, at, because there was a lot of interest in the Dalai Lama and the China problem and there were sort of the Beastie Boys were into Tibetan Buddhism and so it was very hot. But now in the 2000s and certainly in the last five, maybe ten years, I think that's right that Theravada, particularly through Vipassana and um, insight meditation, has finally come into its own. In my experience, Still, people don't know that much about Southeast Asian Buddhism, sort of in Southeast Asia. They and, know this version. And yeah, and we should emphasize that although Theravadan is associated with Southeast Asian Buddhism, and this gets to what we started out talking about, uh, all, in spite of that, people who have been exposed to Theravada Buddhism, Buddhism in the United States are still mainly being exposed to kind of the philosophical dimension of it and the psychological and the, the kind of you know, practical, uh, the part dealing with meditative practice, and your whole point, much of your point, or the, the point of your, your one book, the, the God's Drink Whiskey, is that there's a whole religious part of it in Southeast Asia uh, that is remarkably like religion. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so so, so <laughs> talk, talk about that. What's it, what, what does it mean to be a Buddhist in Southeast Asia? Well, if you... Um... It's a really interesting part of the world because some of the some of the pure stuff that we're now getting in terms of this philosophical stuff is there because really the Rome of Buddhism is Sri Lanka. This is my view of Theravada. So that's where all the Pali manuscript work is done. If you want to train in Buddhism, if you're Thai or if you're Cambodian, you go to Sri Lanka. Most of the great scholars have come out of Sri Lanka. So there is really hardcore Buddhist philosophy. People who studied with Wittgenstein and then went on to, to do their own thing, David Kalupahana, for example. But the religion uh, is really pervasive there. It's not like going to uh, China, where you would be hard-pressed to even know if anybody was Buddhist. You, you don't see religion, religion like you do in Southeast Asia. Everywhere you look in Southeast Asia, you just turn around and there's temples and there's Buddhist monks in these saffron robes and there's incense burning and it is a deeply devotional culture like in India. And what you have in uh, Southeast Asia is you have this old animism which 
uh, I've become a bit of a fan of. And then you have... And, and by uh, animism, we should... Why don't, you, why don't you define that term quickly? Because okay. it's a very prevalent form of religion in much of the world. Yeah, I think um, we tend to think of monotheisms and maybe we'll throw in, you know, Buddhism or Hinduism. But really, I think the oldest and the most widespread religion is animism, which is basically the belief that there are spirit beings sort of uh, invisible and they're ubiquitous. They're everywhere. They're in my backyard. They're in the river. They're in the mountain. They're in the stream. Anybody who's ever seen the Hayao Miyazaki Japanese animation film knows that mm -hmm. that's all animism stuff. And in Africa, it's, it dominates. In Asia, it dominates. And what you see, for example, if you go into a Thai restaurant, is there'll be a little shrine. And um, it'll be sort of by the uh, cash register by the kitchen and then the owners will put uh, lotus leaves or incense or maybe shot glasses with whiskey or vodka and the idea is that you're trying to draw the tutelary spirits to live inside this house by making it really so, good. So they'll, they'll come in for the free drinks and then they'll right. take good care of your restaurant? That's right. And, and then, then it's, it's like giving cops free coffee if you run a Dunkin' Donuts. It's exactly the same principle. And then they won't shake you down or make your business <laughs> fall apart or anything like that. And so this is this dominates in Southeast Asia. And it's so uh, it's such a syncretic religion. So you have animism. Then you have this ancient Brahmanism or Hinduism built on top of that. And then you have Buddhism built on top of that. So you have these three layers. And the average Buddhist is all three of these things. They, they see no problem. And, and, and did they they don't think of the animistic part as part of their Buddhism per se, or do they even ask themselves the question? It, it, it is not. If you talk to somebody, one of these Sri Lankan monks who's been educated in Sri Lanka um, or, you know, has got a formal education, he knows better. But that's not how most Buddhists see it sort of on the ground. In fact, I would go to Buddhist temples in Southeast Asia and sort of over in the corner there would be one of these animistic shrines and the Buddhist monks would also be making offerings there mm -hmm. too. And it, it wasn't considered to be a violation of Buddhist principles. But if you know the scriptures very well, uh, you know that the Buddha himself was uh, thought that a lot of this stuff was just distracting. Mm -hmm. it, so we should take sort of an agnostic view towards it. Okay, so there's, there's the animism. I mean, as for supernatural elements that you, you find uh, infusing the lives of Buddhists in Asia, there's, there's the animism that, that, that maybe has uh, origins technically independent from Buddhism. But then Buddhism itself has super... It, Buddhist doctrine includes supernatural elements, right? Right, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, this stuff usually gets edited out of the Western... Uh, versions of Buddhism, and there's good reason for that because there are many things the Buddha said uh, that where he was trying to revise and critique the Brahmanistic tradition that he grew up in, which was not only very hierarchical but was also very uh, ritualistic and supernatural. Uh, but also, Buddhism has all kinds of stuff. If you look at the original scriptures, um, there's a the idea of reincarnation is very strong that you're going to come back repeatedly the jataka tales are stories that are not that well known in the west but everybody in southeast asia knows the jataka tales those are the stories of the buddha's previous lives before he was gautama siddhartha and uh, kids learn buddhism this way and they're wonderful utterly charming stories about how the buddha overcame some bully some monster in the forest with compassion so you learn a lot of Buddhism this way, but it's all filled with supernatural powers and deities. And um, and then the cultures of Buddhism that grew up later also had a lot of supernatural stuff. If you look at uh, all Asians know the story of uh, Journey to the West or Shioji, which is this monkey king uh, who was tamed by the Tang monk uh, Xuanzang. And the Tang monk goes to India and gets the scriptures from, from, of Buddhism and brings it back to China. Now, that's true. That really happened. And Chinese Buddhism really got going during this period. But then this elaborate supernatural story that's like a Star Wars uh, movie uh, grew up around it. And so a lot of Asians learn their Buddhism from that story, Journey to the West, which mm -hmm. has like a monkey that can make himself the size of a planet or the size of a bug, and then the, the Buddha makes his hand the size of the universe and all kinds of crazy stuff. Okay, and you mentioned deity. So, I mean, Buddhists, leave aside the, the animistic uh, 
in syncretism. The, um, I mean, Buddhists, they make offerings to deities and ask for stuff, right? I mean, kind of like uh, Christians ask for things in prayer, right? Yeah, right. If you, um, if you ask, uh, again, a monk who's well-trained, he knows the difference between, the, usually the Buddhists will, will uh, follow the triple gems, and the triple gems are you ask um, the Sangha or the community for help when you need help, you ask uh, the Buddha for help, and you, and you turn to the Dharma, which is the teachings. But a, a, a trained Buddhist knows that when you ask the Buddha for help, what you're doing is trying to just focus your mind on the Buddha as a sort of inspirational guide. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's kind of a natural, they understand that that's a naturalistic move. Um, but I would say 98% of all Buddhists living in Asian countries think instead of the Bodhisattva ideal or the Buddha as a spiritual being who can grant favors. Mm -hmm. And in addition to the Buddha, there's the belief that there are many gods um, and uh, devas and also hungry ghosts. And you basically are negotiating with them, too. The difference, I would say, is they are considered, um, they're, they're divine, they're invisible. They're more like superheroes. Mm -hmm. But they are also, according to the Dharma, they're trying to work out their own enlightenment as well. So it's not like the, not like Western gods who are already enlightened. They're on their path too and trying to overcome craving. So you can get them to do work for you, but they're not um, they're not perfected. Mm -hmm. They're just really powerful. So in a way, the, the Buddha is not entirely unlike Jesus. I mean, the Christians, Jesus died but lives on, and they pray sometimes. Sometimes direct their prayers to Jesus per se. I mean, we won't get into the Trinity and all the complications. But the, a, a prayer might begin. They may say, "Please Jesus," rather than "Please God." And um, <clears throat> similarly, uh, so Buddhist, you know, the Buddha is no longer on this earth, but he's out there, and the Buddhists might ask him for things. Right, and then it, it gets complicated because the. The, the Theravada tradition tends to stay with the historical Buddha, Gautama. Mm -hmm. But as you, as you know, the Mahayana tradition t starts to celebrate these other characters, the Bodhisattvas. And Avalokitesvara, for example, is probably the mo one of the most famous ones. Who's, he's a feature of, of Indian Buddhism, but the Chinese really take this up. And it becomes, um, the Chinese version of this is Guan Yin. So most people will recognize this female Buddha They've seen her sort of standing with flowing robes. Usually it's a white porcelain. My grandmother had one of these in her house. Um, they're very common. Um, but the Chinese actually worship and pray to Guan Yin more than the historical Buddha because Guan Yin has become this uh, favor-granting goddess of compassion. And so all of the sort of, you know, talisman and uh, the amulets and everything and the prayers are usually directed to Guan Yin and more Chinese know Guan Yin who's a derivative Buddha than know the historical Buddha Gautama. And is the deal with these bodhisattvas who have lived in the past, I'm a little confused, is the idea that they could have attained enlightenment and you know just lived in nirvanic bliss or something but instead chose to go around helping people uh, or is the idea that they did finally pass over into nirvana? Uh... Yeah, uh, there's two schools of thought on this. Oh, which okay. you say, I think, and I think that's true. That's um, one way to explain it, particularly to Westerners, has been they they could have gone on to this other realm, but they stay in this world to mm -hmm. help. Mm -hmm. But really, nirvana isn't really another realm according to original Buddhism. It's a state it's of... It's an enlightened uh, state of mind being... Uh, uh, you remain on the planet, you function, presumably right. you don't just sit there, but you are enlightened in Nirvana. Right, and so you can imagine that the Bodhisattva works in that scenario as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it's clear that in a Mahayana Buddhism, this uh, bodhisattva has attained sort of eternal life mm -hmm. as well. Like it's not just somebody who, like Gautama, right. attained enlightenment and then lived to be seven. Right. And, and again, it, it's in Mahayana that you would find people, I guess, praying to bodhisattvas. And, and, and Mahayana covers the kind of the great Asian landmass in a way, aside from Southeast Asia, pretty much, right? I mean, China, to yeah. the extent that Buddhism is practiced in China, notwithstanding the discouragement That's of it during, during uh, the communist era. And, and Japan and Korea. Right. And, and, of course, wherever it lands, it takes on the local 
culture as well. Like it was heavily influenced by uh, animism called Ban in Tibet. Mm -hmm. um, in Japan, Shintoism influenced it, and I think um, Taoism influenced it heavily in China and produced Zen or Chan Buddhism. Mm -hmm. uh, it also slides down the coast into Vietnam. So interestingly, even though Cambodia and Vietnam are right up against each other, it's really this huge divide between Theravada and Mahayana. Mm -hmm. So if you go just across the border into Vietnam, you will see Guan Yin or Quan Am, and lots of bodhisattvas worshipped, whereas in the Theravada countries, it's more the historical Buddha that gets the focus. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, so these bodhisattvas, they're a little like saints in Christianity. They're past figures that lived exemplary lives, and you might actually pray to them. Yeah. Um, the... Uh, so, okay, so uh, I think we've uh, gotten a little clearer on, on how Buddhism is actually practiced. Now, back to the kind of Buddhism that you personally are attracted to. When you um, write a book called Why I'm a Buddhist, um, what, what's, the, what's, what's the case you make? Why are you a Buddhist? And, and what, what kind of Buddhist are you? Uh, okay. <laughs> um, I think... Um... When I started out, I think the attraction was the same attraction that, that uh, many of us had who are lapsed Catholics or uh, people who might have been raised according to some monotheism, but then as they got older, they found this, you know, unsatisfying because, well, science and, um, you know, it also felt a little provincial after a while. So I was attracted to the naturalism of Buddhism, that it was an early psychological theory that said... Um, even though all the stuff you and I have been talking about so far doesn't fit this generalization, the Buddha thinks that you can't really control the external world. So what you can do is control the mind. So I'm going to show you how you can do that. So that was very attractive to me. Um, and also I thought it got, um, it got fairly, it gets deep fast. Like uh, Jesus tells these kind of cool stories. Uh, uh, here's the prodigal son. But the Buddha is actually giving philosophical arguments, which I, I found very um, exhilarating uh, because I was a philosophy major. So I thought, well, this, is, this guy actually has premises and conclusions. And, mm -hmm. um, and then there's a whole tradition of disputation in Buddhism that I was attracted to. But it was definitely much a, more of a, a mental sort of head game for me, I think, early on. And then... Um, I got older and I had a kid and okay, you know, had the various sort of troubles of midlife. And then I thought, you know, uh, there's a lot of therapeutic good in Buddhism too, which is, um, it's very satisfying on a philosophical level because I think the idea of no self or not uh, is probably right for the most part. I think the idea of the, the idea, in other words, that there's not a self, that our sense that there is a self here is kind of an illusion. Yeah, and, and, and of course, the idea of a metaphysical soul, I, I thought, okay, that's uh, charming, but probably not true. And also, the impermanence of all things is a fairly common feature of Buddhism. And the interdependence of everything, the Paticca Samapada, or dependent arising. Mm -hmm. So these metaphysical ideas were attractive, but then the Four Noble Truths really became very attractive to me because I, I believe, um, you know, the Buddha had... Hit, his early life was fairly um, prosperous, opulent, wealthy, and then he left that behind and became kind of a, an ascetic and denied himself pleasures. And then his, uh, he felt that the, neither of these were helping him overcome craving, and so he took this middle way path. And so I think this is one of the really attractive things about Buddhism is that it, is, um, it avoids the extremes and, and basically targets the moderation in all things, mm -hmm. including Buddhism itself. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's hard to sort of turn it into a sort of fanatical ideology. Mm -hmm. uh, and it helps with, uh, with uh, training the mind. Although I've always thought that, you know, when they say it's the middle path, that that was truer in its original context than today. In other words... You know, I guess the early texts say, well, on the one hand, we're not these crazy total ascetics, you know, who are just abusing themselves for spiritual purposes. On the other hand, we're not self-indulgent. But then you look at the path actually laid down by Buddhism. By modern standards, it's pretty austere. Oh, I, yes. I mean, I mean, certainly to get to nirvana, right. you have to, you know, give up. <laughs> I don't want to overstate the case, but all attraction to everything and all aversion to everything almost, you know, that's a, that technically I know people would say it isn't attraction, it's attachment and it isn't whatever, but 
you know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. I mean, the the goal is is for your uh, your happiness to become totally uncorrelated to what's going on around you, and that's that takes some pretty extreme practice to get there. Yeah, um, and you you and I probably know some Zen practitioners who are very austere and humorless and uh, <laughs> and live the sort of ascetic uh, thing. I think there's something attractive to people in that, but I I don't think that's the real Buddhism. Uh, the, the subtitle, I'm trying to remember the subtitle of my book, Why I'm a Buddhist. It's like, oh, uh, it's like Real Buddhism with Red Meat and Whiskey. I can't remember the subtitle of my own book. So that's is, your second whiskey book then? Yeah, so, right. So I obviously drink. Um, and um, part of my reason for making this argument was if you go back and you look at the original texts, there is um, a very ascetic tradition, but that is the Vinaya. That's for the monks. The, mm -hmm. the, the Tripitaka mm -hmm. is really three baskets of wisdom. There's a basket of scriptures that is for the monks, and it's the really ascetic stuff you're talking about. Then there's a basket of stuff that's for the professional philosophers called the Abhidharma or the Abhidhamma. And that's, I, I know you want to get into that too. I think that's probably some it's, interesting it's, stuff. It's, it's largely about psychology. It's like, yeah. theories of the structure of the mind and so on, although, although it is related to practice. It's related to how you, you know, alleviate or eliminate suffering. But, but it's, it's actual kind of psychology. The right. And it's psychology without the self, which is like this phenomenological matrix of events. Mm -hmm. But so there's that. But then the middle basket in the Tripitaka is for lay people. It's like schlubs like me who have kids and and jobs, and we're householders. We're trying to basically get through life. And, and what, that, what kind of things does that say? What kind of guidance does that give? Well, that's the that's uh, where the Four Noble Truths occur. That's where the Dhammapada okay. is. That's where most of the stuff is that we know about. Um, that's where he's saying um, it's not the the pleasure itself that's intrinsically bad, but your attachment to the pleasure. Um, but, but, but even you, that is kind of extreme. It's saying the, the Four Noble Truths say the answer is just give up craving. No problem. Well, well okay. There, okay. I interpret this to mean not that you should uh, not uh, feel anything and not be uh, attracted to things, because I think that's part of the biological equipment. We're organisms. We're mammals. I see something attracted. I'm drawn to it. Um, <clears throat> the Buddha sort of gives this uh, analogy of these two darts, and one of them is... <clears throat> The point is that when the pleasure comes to you, and let's say it's some great chocolate cake or it's some amazing sex, then uh, you have the experience. Great, wonderful. But the problem, the Buddha says, is that then it passes through the system, like every other pleasure, because it's intrinsically uh, uh, impermanent. And then the ego is the second step. It's the ego consciousness that key ego consciousness that chases after it and tries to turn this impermanent experience into a permanent mm -hmm. reality and so fix it. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not the pleasure or the experience that's bad, it's the ego relationship with it. So I read that to mean I can have like a, a you know three fingers of scotch in the evening as long as I'm not overly attached to it, you see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is what's commonly <laughs> said. <laughs> I'm gonna stick with that. You don't need it, you just want it. Um, That's right. Same with the coffee you just had a sip. That's of. right. <laughs> we I'm, all have our vices. I'm familiar with that. Um, okay, so, and do, well, do you meditate as part of your practice? I, I, I used to meditate more uh, before my son was born, um, and I meditate less now because uh, he's a wild child. Um, but I have a kind of um, meditational technique that uh, is it's in keeping with the traditional uh, mindfulness tradition, but it's not sort of sitting still and practicing uh, the various uh, jhana forms of, uh, of meditation. It's more like a walking meditation or the kind of meditation that Zen really popularized with, um, you know, archery and uh, martial arts, for example, in China, Shaolin. Uh, motorcycle maintenance. Um, and in my case, it's drawing. I draw uh, pretty regularly. Daily, if I can, I'll sketch and draw. And it's highly meditative. And I, th I sort of approach it in a Buddhist way. Um, and what is, the, what is the Buddhist way to approach drawing? Well, it, it basically, if you, if you have a good day, it brings the mind into the present moment. It uh, reduces judgment. 
Um, so it's a sort of non-judgmental way of focusing the mind. Um, I think it's a kind of embodied meditation as well, rather than just sort of sitting still and trying to train the mind. I think it's a way of also um, uh, bringing the body into the present moment, which again is something that Zen really sort mm -hmm. of celebrated. Um, I actually think it has some advantages to standard Vipassana meditation, which is, <clears throat> I also think um, drawing is a kind of, uh, there's a kind of a epistemic dimension to drawing that's not widely recognized, which is that drawing is a kind of investigation. Um, and you actually uh, learn something about the object that you're drawing, uh, if, if in fact you're drawing an object. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and then um, it, it uh, turns off some of this sort of mind wandering and distraction that's so common and um, reduces a lot of, um, you know, the, the sort of constant distraction that our culture is really good at. Yep. So, well, certainly part of meditation, especially the first part, is to quiet the mind and Focusing on a task can do that. Um, do, does, does your approaching uh, drawing in a Buddhist spirit benefit from your years of sitting meditation? I, I like to think it does. Um, I, can't, uh, I can't be sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I think it does. It helps me concentrate better. Um, it, you know, there's a lot of this evidence coming out of uh, fMRI studies, and you know this material well, which is that... Uh, really good meditators seem to be able to have more control over over some of these uh, you know even subcortical functions um, so I'm hoping uh, that I'm able to sort of focus better on the drawing uh, but meditation is um, you know one of the things I learned in uh, in Southeast Asia was that uh, you have to have a middle way approach to meditation as well and some people really get addicted to meditation and think it's the end-all, be-all mm -hmm. of, uh, of Buddhism. And really, uh, I remember this guy telling me in Thailand, he said, you know, you have good days, you have bad days. <laughs> if you have a bad day, the next day you just try to dedicate yourself again. You don't beat your, yourself up too much. You try to also, while you're having all this compassion for everybody else, you should direct some of it towards yourself. And I think this is true about meditation. So I do what I can. I may not be the best, but it, it's definitely therapeutic and helps. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, you wrote a paper about affective neuroscience and the concept of self, right? Do I have that? Are those both in the title? I forget. Yeah. But, but um, do you want to just briefly tell us what the idea is there? And we should say, again, part of Buddhism is this idea that the self in some sense does not exist. That That's one of its more radical claims and historically what really distinguishes it from the Hindu philosophy in which it emerged. This right. was the real point of divergence. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, uh, I mean, there's sort of two, two places where I think uh, Buddhism critiques the self. One is uh, this metaphysical idea that uh, Hinduism had developed really for millennia, which is that Atman is this divine part of yourself. Which At Atman means self in, in uh, right. Sanskrit. Yeah. It's not in Sanskrit. And it, it is like a part of God that's temporarily in you and so estranged from the Godhead. And your job is to perfect yourself to such a degree that the uh, Atman or self will return to God. And then you'll get off the wheel of becoming um, and no longer return. Um, so the Buddha was critical of that view because for a lot of, probably for three major reasons. One we recognize right away, which is so, sort of scientific. He was, he was fairly empirical in his approach and he said, we don't see any, anything like this. Show me the soul, show me the self. Um, there's no evidence for this thing. Uh, and he also thought there were moral reasons for rejecting it because he thought that if you believe in this, then you're going to be concerned with protecting it in your next life, in your next life, and then you're not going to see the people who need your help in the here and now. So he thought that morally it was inferior to believe in a self or a soul. It, it trained your vision too far into the distance. But then there's this other uh, aspect of self, which is, um, well, what about like my sense of agency? You know, how, what about just I'm Steve and I'm looking at you now and <laughs> I'm in my desk. And I'm in, I'm kind of in charge of me, right. so to, it's this chief executive notion of the self. Right? Exactly. Right. Now, that doesn't necessarily have any metaphysical stuff attached to it. I mean, Descartes thought it did, but Hume thought, um, David Hume thought, 
um, I don't see this self anywhere, and you're not entitled to say that it's a thing. Um, that's just a bias you have. And everywhere I look inside my mind with introspection, I just find the contents of my consciousness. I don't find the self anywhere. It's the thing that's doing the looking, you know. And so um, the Buddha looks like he sort of uh, presaged this idea that Hume comes up with. And uh, really, you know, thousands of years before. And um, now this topic is very hot because in neuroscience and in philosophy, people like Dan Dennett, as you know, um, have argued, and you were, you were making this argument with regard to modules, that, that really there is no centralized self. It's really just a sort of interplay of these different selves, some of which might be um, focused on the body at this moment, and then at another moment they might be focusing on some intellectual ideation of some kind. And so the Buddha says exactly this. He says, look, you, you and I don't have a self. We're made up of these five parts or khandhas. It's body, uh, perception, feeling, uh, volition, sometimes translated, translates as uh, disposition, but it's basically will, and then consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so he says, you're just these five things. When you die, these five things basically they, they go on, but you don't. They sort of disperse, sort of like we think about conservation of energy or something like this. Mm -hmm. um, and so this, uh, I think, has led a lot of people to, to say, well, the self is just a fiction. And so, for example, Dan Dennett has said, um, the self is a center of narrative gravity. We talk ourselves into having a self when it doesn't really exist. And there's sort of maybe there's adaptive reasons for that. So I, I basically think this is probably correct. On the other hand, I think that the current conversation could be very much informed by effective neuroscience, which doesn't, hasn't seemed to penetrate this conversation. So my goal is to try to penetrate this conversation. And we should say, I mean, affective neuroscience, you know, deals with affect. I mean, as, as distinguished from just garden variety neuroscience with particular emphasis on feelings, emotions, and so on. Right, exactly. So I, I, uh, I, I had the great uh, privilege to work with Dr. Yak Pangsep, who's considered the father of right. effective neuroscience. And he, along with others like Richard Davidson and Antonio Damasio, sort of create this field where you're, you're sort of studying how do the emotions work. And they, each of these guys has a different taxonomy of the emotions. In Pangsep's case, it's seven uh, emotional systems, stuff you would right away recognize, rage, um, uh, lust, care, s the seeking system. And what he has is, he actually has a lot of evidence that's been done, um, work that he did directly on animals, stuff that you can't do on humans for ethical reasons. We get some of this data from lesion studies in subcortical re regions that confirms this data, but these, these guys were basically working with animals. And they were doing electrical stimulation of the brain. They were basically, in Pankcep's case, they decorticated rat, rats and rodents. They took their cortex off and saw what the result was. And so, make a long story short, the, the sort of um, emerging view in effective neuroscience is that there is a sort of concentrated sense of self that's way down in the subcortical brain. Uh, basically, Panksepp locates it in the midbrain, in the uh, paraequiductal gray, the PAG. This is like way down at the base. So these are older, evolutionarily older parts of the brain? The oldest parts and, of the brain. And he locates it there in the sense that what? That, that in cases where it's damaged, the people don't have a strong sense of self or what? The, the uh, Damasio and Panksepp agree that th this region, with some modification about where it is exactly, if it's compromised, the animal loses all sense of motor and uh, sort of sensory agency. It, it can't function. But you can basically strip back large parts of the cortex and even the limbic system until the animal uh, and the animal's agency is not compromised. I mean, other problems occur, obviously, but the thing, animals can feed themselves and they seem to function and engage even in social behavior. And there have been these sad cases where even children have been born with very compromised uh, neocortexes um, that Damasio looks at, and strangely enough, they have uh, relatively rich emotional lives and a sense of what he thinks is agency. So, 
Effective neuroscience suggests there's a much older core self or proto-self. Then on top of that, I want to layer um, something like uh, uh, what we would describe as sort of personality. And then on top of that, the third layer would be something like uh, Dennett's center of narrative gravity or Damasio calls this the autobiographical self. Mm -hmm. This is the self that you actually weave together through propositional discourse in your own head. And what I think has happened is that philosophers have gotten all excited about, oh, there's no self in this propositional neocortical mind. Uh, and then they've sort of thrown it out. And my argument is, well, there actually, there may be this more archaic self, which animals possess and that we still possess. And that um, philosophy and neuroscience is really just looking at this um, much more recent evolutionary self, which arises with the with with language and propositional thought. Yeah. Well, I mean, certainly beliefs about yourself would have to be relatively recent in evolutionary time because they have to await consciousness of yourself. And that's kind of largely what Buddhist philosophy is attacking, right? It, it's I mean, it's not saying that there's not a kind of integrated motivational system that's concerned with the welfare of this organism. Right. Obviously, there is. It's saying that your conception of what you are, or what's in there, is in some sense mistaken. Right. Yeah. So I do say this in the piece. My my argument is, well, this kind of work that Buddhism is interested in, that Hume, that Dennett is interested in, will largely stay focused in the neocortical conscious mind. But my argument is that that mind is probably only, well, if you want to, if you want to put the origin of language back to 50,000 years ago, or if you want to be really sort of bold and put it back to 200,000 years ago, that's still a drop in the bucket mm -hmm. compared to the evolution of the limbic system, which I think is goes back to the origin of mammals, that's like 200 million years under construction. My suspicion is that th those aspects of the human being are still having a huge role as they come up through the neocortical. And, more and, and are you thinking that those older parts are more kind of pervasively and fundamentally affective yes. uh, about feeling than the more recent parts of the brain, some of which seem pretty rational, um, that, that's part of what you're saying. Yes, but, but notice that in Buddhism, it, it's relevant to, to get into this subcortical territory because craving has to, it, or it originates there. Right. So no matter how we retrain the propositional mind to deal with our affective drives, the drives are old and right. dominating and so this is one of the things where I, I think in a way, even though I, I consider myself a good Buddhist, I also think maybe the Stoics and Spinoza understood this better because they thought, well, you sort of can't just cognitively reframe uh, your complete lusty attraction to this person and expect that it's going to go away. Rather, you have to sort of push the negative affect out with positive affect. Hmm. And these are different sort of therapeutic strategies that I think um, they're not they're not uh, contrary to Buddhism, no. but Buddhism still is sort of a head game compared to I think uh, sort of these Stoic ideas. And Stoicism had a lot in common with Buddhism, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, both of them are saying, uh, you know, you got to deal with the world. There's good stuff. There's bad stuff. The problem often with the bad stuff is the way you're conceiving of the bad yeah. stuff and reacting yes. to it, and that's within your control. What's not in your control is the stuff out there itself. So yeah, there's, a lot, so. there's a lot they share, but, but, uh, but you're saying there is a little bit of a difference in strategy. I, I mean, th this is just a matter of emphasis, really, uh -huh. because um, sometimes I'll see Buddhists talk about, well, um, you, if, you, if you, let's say you, they'll even put people in an fMRI uh, reader, and they'll show them these disturbing images. And then they'll say, well, let's try to downgrade uh, the negative affect that you're feeling. Um, and they'll use these strategies. And some of them are, well, let's try to cognitively reframe what you just experienced. And so the, 
the experimenter will remind the person, it's just a movie, it's just a photograph, it's not real. And sure enough, you can see where this helps down-regulate um, some of the negative affect. The amygdala starts to quiet down, this kind of stuff. But also, um, people use positive affect to regulate negative affect quite regularly. We all do it. Like, you feel miserable. You can sit and meditate, or you can go for a run. Mm -hmm. Going for a run produces all this great brain chemistry, mm -hmm. sort of knocks negative affect out. And I guess I'm, I'm saying this is part of Buddhism. Part of Buddhism is understanding your own psychology to the extent that now it might be time for a jog <laughs> or, you know, or to draw something or play a musical instrument. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be conquered by, uh, by Vipassana or sitting still and meditating the mind. I don't think that's always the solution. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, I mean, there are times, there are things that you would like to control where you can't substitute jogging. And, and I find one is just like procrastination. Like if you're sitting there and you're supposed to be working and you get this urge to do anything but work, right. it's like go, you know, go check your Twitter feed, right. go get something to eat. And I'm trying to get to a point where I respond to those by just pausing and being a little, and just observing, not, not going, I don't, not necessarily going over and sitting down on a cushion, but pausing, maybe even closing my eyes and observing the impulse that is, yeah. that is driving the distraction, the impulse to go get something to eat or something, and then do that a while, and then go get something to eat. No, actually, yeah. no, you're supposed <laughs> to not get something to eat. But anyway, the, 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 you know, I do my daily exercise, you know, as well, but there, there are, at, at a kind of a micro level, you know, I, I think sometimes a little dose of mindfulness can be uh, what you need in the short term. Well, I agree. I mean, the, and that, that actually, uh, in, in my life, that works better, too, uh, just for practical reasons. I don't have large chunks of my day to dedicate mm -hmm. to sitting. Um, but I think that you hit it on the head because you're trying to basically uh, what, um, sort of create some gap between the impulse and the, and the behavior or mm -hmm. the impulse and the, and the sort of uh, rumination. And so even these little moments where you stop and, like you said, close your eyes or at least try to observe it, right, um, right. Uh, yeah. help give you that little gap between yeah. um, feeling it and then chasing it. Yeah, observing it lessens its grip on you when right. things go well, when it works. Right, exactly. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay. Um, so let's, uh, in the time remaining, let's talk a little about uh, this piece you wrote for the Chronicle of Higher Ed about how you think misconceptions about what religion is around the world uh, kind of uh, distort the debate about uh, whether, you know, religion good or bad, or how do we tell good forms of religion from bad, and um, so on. This is put in the context of, of the new atheists, but right. it's, it's not confined to that context. But anyway, why don't you talk a little bit about what you think uh, a lot of people don't appreciate about what some of the benefits of uh, religion are in parts of the world that we're not so familiar with. Yeah, um, I, I think... Uh... I, I was taking the New Atheists to task because uh, I thought they had um, placed a, a premium on – the confusion I saw was they were saying, well, religion is basically trying to explain nature and give us morality. And really, science comes along and is much better at explaining nature, so that's gone. And really um, – Empirical study does a pretty good job figuring out what's good for humans too. So we really don't we don't need religion for morality either. And so the the sort of uh, inference there was well, religion the, its job has been taken over by better sort of disciplines. And my view was that this was a very provincial sort of assumption about religion. And if you get out of traditional monotheism and the developed world and into animistic countries, or Buddhist countries, Hindu countries, um, and the developing world, you see very different functions of religion. For the most part, most of the people that you meet um, in Southeast Asia um, or in African religions are not interested in developing a, a cosmology or an explanation of nature. There'll be, a, there'll be a mythology. People will know it. Okay, fine. It's just in the background. 
Um, and they're not particularly interested in using their religion to figure out how to treat each other better. They're not morally um, motivated. For the most part, they seem to be motivated by um, two other things, well, three other things, probably what's called soteriology, which is am I, what's my salvation going to be like, what's going to happen to me after death. Or, um, but then these two other things that really interested me, one was um, just uh, the kind of uh, how do I attain better peace and happiness in a world of servitude and misery? which is a common problem in the developing world, which is, why, uh, which is why I think Christianity was attractive in the Roman period and why Stoicism was attractive and why Buddhism was attractive, because life is hard. And so what people are looking for in religion is how to get some inner peace and also how to influence through devotional and ritual cultures the, the powers that are beyond them. And when you factor those things in, the story is more complicated and more interesting. Um, so my argument was that these guys need to get out into the religious world. And so my my view is now I know you know uh, Christopher Hitchens was a great journalist and went all over the world, and so this sort of criticism doesn't quite apply to him. But I think these other guys have have learned a lot about um, the rest of the world more through books. Maybe that's unfair. Fine, I said it. Um, and uh, and instead, if you get out there in the world, what you begin to see is that religion is more about um, emotional management. What's happening is people are trying to, are using their religion as a way to, not just the Durkheimian view where you have a kind of a social glue. That's definitely a big part of religion, I think. People have alliances in the developing world which are religious, and it really pr helps them survive. Um, but also, I think um, religion helps people handle these emotional systems that we were talking about earlier that I'm, I'm really kind of into now because of affective neuroscience. Mm -hmm. I think we have like a finite list of these, you know, everybody has sort of lust and sexual attraction. Everybody has um, families and they have to deal with things like um, filial devotion, uh, loyalty, betrayal. Um, and everybody has anger management problems and, and everybody dies. And so, uh, what I begin to see, my own view, is that religion is is sort of better at sort of sculpting these emotions in a way that that's adaptive for the individual and for the group. So my own view is that religion is adaptive, that it evolved, that it continues to be successful and useful in places where people are less prosperous than we are in this country, um, and that sh that stuff should be added to the conversation. And. and and so one feature of lives in less prosperous countries is a kind of chaotic right. quality often. I mean, you know, stuff happens more unpredictably, more catastrophically, more painfully uh, than, it, than it might um, in, a, in, a, in a more technologically modern society. That's right. Uh, and, 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 reli and, and religion, including the animistic religion that, that, that we talked about, is... is plays its role in making sense of that. And, uh, yeah, because if you even you just pick one place like Cambodia where I lived, e even recent history will show, uh, you know, first they were in, just even in the last century dominated by foreign powers. Then comes uh, independence, but then comes American carpet bombing, the Vietnam War, the Khmer Rouge, the war with the Vietnamese. They have a prime minister who who basically, if you disagree with him, you end up dead. Like, you just walk down the street in Cambodia, and on everybody's house, where their windows are, there's, like, people have just created, like, um, barbed wire using broken glass. Like, it, it's a world that's very different from the world you and I are living in. Mm -hmm. And even, I would argue that some of our really, I know that we have some very bad poverty in this country, too. But this is, that, that times, you know, I don't know times what, but you literally every few seconds your people are having limbs blown off there from landmines. Mm -hmm. So in this part of the world, if you come to them with, oh, you know, there's a God, there's a deistic God who laid down the laws of nature and they function inexorably and all you have to do is, you know, do science and um, maybe, uh, you know, uh, focus on these sort of secular values, life is going to be much better. They're going to laugh at this. Mm -hmm. Because their their world is very capricious, and so the religion they have sort of matches that, and it gives them a kind of power 
Um, now you might say, well, it's not real power. It would be better to have antibiotics than have some, some shaman putting blood on the door. I agree. I totally agree. But there are consolations. Uh, what's, the great, what's the great line that uh, Roger Scruton said? It was, uh, the, the consolations from imaginary things are not imaginary consolations. Mm -hmm. In other words, um, even if some of this stuff doesn't you know, seem compelling from a scientific point of view, clearly people are managing their emotional lives quite well uh, using these systems. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if you, if you want to say, well, it's opiate of the masses, um, my own argument is, uh, what's so bad about opiates? Um, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not promoting You've uh, already sung the praises of whiskey. Why not go all the way? Uh, I'm not, you know, I say that with uh, tongue in cheek. Mm. And, you know. Of course, their answer would be, it's not, it's not just they're choosing an opiate, but, but the idea is there's someone using the opiate to exploit them. That's the classic. I mean, that, that's what right. Marx meant by the term, is right. that, that there are, there's an upper class taking advantage of uh, people by numbing them uh, to, the, to the pain that the system inflicts. That, uh, and, and that is a um, compelling argument and made sense and does make sense in certain contexts. However, in the parts of the world where I lived that were Buddhist, it actually was the reverse uh, and that it was um, communism. It was Marx's ideas oh, right. that influenced Mao and Pol Pot that basically sought to break up the family, modernize, you eliminate um, all allegiance to religion and the family and you dedicate it to the party and in that way you start world over um, and you have a modern society from year zero. Well, um, in my own view, uh, this was uh, terribly, uh, this attempt at secularization mm -hmm. uh, has blood on its hands. Right. And so uh, if the idea is, oh, let's go into the world where these animists and Buddhists are so supernatural and give them better drains and machinery and secularism. Uh, well, that was tried and it was done very badly. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm not sure we should just assume that uh, modernization along these mm -hmm. secular lines is better in this part of the world. Of course, Marx might say Maoism isn't exactly what I had in mind, but... It, we'll, true, we'll... that's true, except that on the religious, on the religious view, um, it's the style of, of eliminating religion, I suppose, that we can all disagree with. But I think there's many people, in, even in the New Atheist movement, who would say, well, I don't like what Marx, I don't like what Mao did, um, but they do think that, that uh, everybody would be better off without religion, which is what yeah. Mao thought. Yeah. And it's... I, I just want to say there are forms of suffering and human vulnerability that science is never going to be able to speak to. And they are irrational because they're basically affective emotional systems. Mm -hmm. Your loved one dies. I I'm sorry. There's no. There is no consolation for that except the magical. And well, so it. literal opiates. I mean, there, there's pharmaceutical intervention, which is a product of science. But, but yeah, that's the, the the ones we know of have their downside. They're not widely available. And your point is that uh, religion um, religion actually can play a role there. A, a yeah, therapeutic role. because if you if you look at uh, you know the social bonding neurotransmitter that everybody likes to talk about oxytocin, mm -hmm. the internal opioids of, the, of uh, that we all have, that stuff gets triggered very strong when you have social interaction, the, the pro-social experiences, and those are oh, those are natural. You get high with a little help from your friends. You know, mm -hmm. you you hang out with them, you feel better. Well, it it turns out that religious rituals have the wisdom that when you lose a loved one, that's what a funeral is about, is that you basically have these opioids triggered through real contact with your family and friends. And I don't see, and, I, and your example of a pharma, pharmaceutical solution is just another one. Uh, I'm simply saying that we need to at least appreciate that religion is sort of a ready-made system for doing this in a, in a relatively natural way. I mean, there's supernaturalism in it, but you understand yeah. um, it's already available to most of us in that sense. Okay. Well, thanks uh, very much for taking the time. You're working on another book now. You seem to come out with one every, uh, every few years. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually writing a uh, Evolution of Mind, a book with a psychologist named Rami Gabriel, and it's uh, going to come out with, with Harvard, but probably not for another year or two. Hmm. And um, 
So I, we're trying to make this argument that uh, the emotional uh, mind, it needs to get its due in the current conversation. I quite agree. And that it infiltrates, uh, the feeling infiltrates so-called cognition more than some people realize. Right. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thanks so much. Uh, we'll let you get back to the finishing up the book. But maybe, maybe we'll continue the conversation down the road. Yeah, I would love to. Thanks okay. a lot, Bob. Okay, take care.